Hi, I'm Tracy Jacobs, the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Towson University. I want to welcome you to the preview of fall classes. And this is a very unusual format for our preview, as you know. Um, but as you also know, this has been a very unusual time. I hope that you and your loved ones are healthy and staying safe. To help ensure the well being of our OSHA members and our instructors, we will be holding all of our 2020 fall classes online via Zoom starting September 14th. We have a mix of four week and eight week courses for you to choose from. And today you'll get to hear from many of our 2020 instructors um, for the fall who are going to talk to you today about their upcoming classes. We hope it will help you to get a sense of the courses and the instructors. And I wanna note that the catalog this semester is online. You can find it by going to www.towson.edu slash OSHER. We miss seeing your faces and we hope that we can return to in-person classes soon. But being online does have its perks as we've learned from our summer lecture series. Number one, you are able to enjoy the live courses from the comfort of your home without, without any worries about traffic or parking. You can wear whatever you want, pants, no pants, you decide. For example, you have no idea right now if I'm even wearing pants. I'll give you a clue, I am. We have plenty of room in all of our courses. There's just one exception to that. Um, and that's a discussion course called To Kill a Mockingbird, Whose Story Is It?, which does have a limited enrollment. Um, but in all of our other courses, we really have plenty of space um, and therefore we should not have any wait lists in those other courses, including in both of Joseph Kassar's courses. Um, he's teaching two. One is called The Artists of the Cote d'Azur and the other is called The Bauhaus. Registration will open at midnight on August 11th, and we have registration instructions and a video demonstration on our website. We'll also have some frequently asked questions that'll help you um, if you stumble at all. But if you have any issues trying to register, please email OSHER staff at osher at towson.edu. OSHER staff has been working from home since mid-March, and we will continue to do so this semester. For that reason, we are encouraging online registration, and we wanna let you know that email is the best way to reach us. If you do choose to mail in your registration, note that delays are possible. Well, I don't wanna take up too much more of the time that we have together with this introduction but I do wanna thank all of you for your continued participation and support of the OSHER Lifelong Learning Institute at Towson University. Thank you for being lifelong learners who have been willing to adapt and who want to continue to learn. Thank you ahead of time for your grace as we are also adapting and learning. We understand how important it is to provide the best experience for you and while we can't see you in person this semester, we're very excited to have you join us online. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the following preview presentations. And also, please wear pants. Greetings, Seth Keibel here. Now if I'm jamming with a group of jazz musicians anywhere in the world, and they turn to me and say, put an Ellington ending on it. I know exactly what they mean. They mean at the end of the song, I gotta go. You've all heard that a gazillion times before. Well, that's an Ellington ending because Duke Ellington wrote that as the conclusion for so many of his compositions. He loved that ending and it's a great example of the Ellington style. It's perfect, it's graceful, it's got a symmetry, it's got complexity and simplicity all wrapped into one nice little tidy riff. Now, if that same group of jazz musicians turns to the pianist and say, put a bassy ending on it, it means at the end of the song, when everyone else stops, the pianist has to go. You've all heard that a gazillion times as well. That's a bassy ending. And that is also a perfect distillation of the Count Basie style. Swinging, perfect, yet ridiculously simple. 
Uh, I could teach any of you on the piano to go in a matter of minutes. Some of you, it might take a little longer. Anyway, if you sign up for my class, American Jazz Royalty, you will learn useful information like this about Duke Ellington and Count Basie and other American jazz greats. And one of the advantages of these virtual classes is you can dance along to your heart's content. You can sing along to your heart's content as out of tune and off key as you like. And the only people you'll bother are the loved ones with whom you're quarantined. Anyway, we're going to have a lot of fun, listen to a lot of music, see some great video footage, and I hope to see you in class this fall. Hi, my name is Julie Cruzava, and I want to invite you to join me for my four-week class this fall, which is called The Great American Songbook, The Art of Interpretation. Now, we all have favorite songs or performances, but for me, as a singer and as a voice teacher, the most interesting question is, what is it? exactly that makes a particular performance memorable or makes you want to hear it again. And so during each class, we're going to listen to contrasting performances of the same song by two or three different artists. Uh, we're going to think about the distinctions of vocal color and stylistic differences. This could be phrasing, this could be tempo, this could be the musical arrangement, this would be all kinds of wonderful things. So for example, we'll compare Tony Bennett to Frank Sinatra or Judy Garland and Ella Fitzgerald. So it, could, it really could be anything. So this is my invitation, step into my world and evaluate performances like a singer would do. And at the end of the class, I'm hoping that each of you has a little bit better understanding of what it is that you like and why. So I hope to see you then, thanks. Hello, my name is Ellen Katz and I have been on the faculty of OSHA for over 10 years as the Broadway teacher. I love to teach classes about Broadway. It might be closed in New York, but it's here open at Osher. I'll be broadcasting from my Broadway Zoom room, and I will be bringing you four fun and fabulous musicals. The first one is Mamma Mia, the happiest musical based on the fabulous music of Swedish group ABBA. We'll travel to a Greek island where we'll, we'll meet Sophie, who's played by Merle Streep and her daughter. And her daughter wants to get married, but she has potentially three fathers. So we'll join in the fun with that. Then we move on to Hello, Dolly. And this is my Hello, Dolly hat. Did you know that Hello, Dolly is based on an English farce written in 1835? We're going to meet Carol Channing and Bette Midler and some other famous Dollies. Next, we'll go on to La Cage aux Folles, set in Paris with its uplifting story of family and identity, and also wonderful songs by the same composer as Hello Dolly, Jerry Herman. We'll love the songs La Cage aux Folles, I Am What I Am, and The Best of Times is Now. And then we wind up our four weeks with the jazz era musical Chicago. In the jazz era, women were arrested for killing their husbands, but they get away with it. It's all that jazz that happens in Chicago during the 20s. So please join me for four weeks of fun musicals. Join in, sing along. You'll be in for a real treat. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Greg Jones. I named this class eight plays everyone should know because each one continues to be produced and more importantly continues to tell us something wonderful about human beings and how we navigate life. Uh, Moliere's Tartuffe is as timely as today's televangelists and if you think Eliza Doolittle is only that sweet heroine from My Fair Lady, wait till we talk about Pygmalion. So three reasons why I hope you'll like this class. One, you can read the play in advance or not of course, you'll get more out of it if you do, and I'll provide free links and suggestions to find each of them online. I'll also recommend YouTube performances that you can watch in advance if you like. Reason two, when possible, I'll be bringing in local actors who I hope will join us live and perform brief scenes from the plays. I'll also show clips of the plays performed by great actors like Christopher Plummer, Wendy Hiller, Lee J. Cobb, and others. Reason three is the best one. I don't talk too much. I'll provide some context, 
show you some jazzy PowerPoints and clips. And then my hope is to have a lively discussion using the chat function where you can bring as much to the party as my guests and I do. Of course, I'll miss seeing you in 3D, but I think we'll still have some fun. Stay safe. I hope to see you in the fall. Hi, my name is Howard Cohn. Please join me as we'll explore the creative process of five of the finest glass artists working in the world today. Three female artists from America and two male artists from Italy and Sweden. Their work is inspired by nature and ancient cultures. You'll learn about the beautifully designed stringed instruments made by Davide Salvadori that look like they are from the courts of the Medici and the dynamic and regal glass sculpture of sweet Seattle artist Shelley Musilaski Allen. Shelley's animals, her horses, bears, and deer are just as dynamic as the Western art of Remington and as beautiful as the horses from the Blue Writer group of Kandinsky and Mark. Pullman and Knowles sculptures are inspired by their travels to the ancient cult culture and tribes in Zimbabwe, Namibia, Laos, Thailand, and Cambodia. They create shaman, super entities, and female wisdom keepers that nurture and pass down the ancient wisdom of the tribes to future generations. Finally, Swedish artist Bertil Wallin uses his fervent imagination and creates huge, extraordinary glass ships filled with Jungian archetypal symbols to take us on a voyage of self-discovery or into the unknowable future. I've reached out to all the artists during the pandemic to find out more about their current work. So please join me in this intriguing journey into the minds and the creative process of these inspirational glass artists. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Come to American Murals. I'm Catherine Fernstrom and I'm offering the course for Osher. Uh, in American murals, and the class will look at murals from prehistory to the present. Socially, murals identify religious beliefs, ethnic identity, and neighborhoods. They celebrate heroes, and they beautify the landscape. We'll consider both the physical and aesthetic qualities of the murals and the social context of mural production and viewing. For example, these seven periods of mural making are all socially different, uh, and if I list them in chronic chronological order, uh, we can say that we can see that American Indian murals asserted earliest presence on the land before Europeans and up to the present. Beaux Arts murals assert Euro American nation building power in the 18th and 19th centuries. The WPA was a social program of assistance during the 1930s Depression, uh, and their murals had citizenship rules and aesthetic preferences. Mexican muralism of the 1930s presented a socialist challenge to American society. For example, Edsel Ford was happy with Diego Rivera's work, but Rockefeller was unhappy with the mural he commissioned and he destroyed the mural. 1960s social movements include Martin Luther King's civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the Chicano field workers movements. Uh, Black Lives Matter, most recently, includes Muriel Bowser's 16th Street mural. Uh, and there are grassroots murals, um, uh, subjects that I haven't listed here in this particular uh, presentation. So come to American Murals and learn more about them. Thank you, hope to see you there. Greetings everyone, uh, my name is Steve Dembo and I will be presenting uh, Social Reform Through Photography uh, this fall. Um, social documentary photographers appeared almost around the time photography was uh, discovered. Uh, guys like Hill and Adamson and John Thompson and others began documenting in the mid to late 1800s. But Jacob Riss, who documented the crowded tenements of the Lower East Side of New York City, is considered the first socially conscious photographer and one of the first photographers to use a flash apparatus to light, uh, light up the tenements. Um, he also caused a fire in one of the rooms, uh, which was, we'll talk about at the time too. Along with Lewis Hine and others, he provided photographic proof critical to the social reform movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, they laid the groundwork for those who followed, the photographers of the Farm Security Administration during the Depression, uh, including Walker Evans, Dorothy Lange, Gordon Parks, and many other New Deal image makers, and photographers of the civil rights movements, of course. Uh, we'll also take a look at more contemporary photographers 
of, of uh, including Eugene Smith, um, Sebastian Salgado, others are known and not so well known, uh, presenting a lot of images and quite a bit of history, disturbing and enlightening. So I hope you'll join me um, in the fall for this very cool, interesting presentation. Anyway, thanks, be safe, um, and smile. Bye. Hi, I'm Peter Lev, Professor Emeritus of Electronic Media and Film, Towson University. My course is about Anya Sparta and Jacques Demy, two French filmmakers who are also a married couple. Sparta went back and forth between fiction and documentary in a very long career, 1995 to 2019. She was a pioneering female director, greatly admired in France, the United States, and around the world. Demy was famous for the film Umbrellas of Cherbourg and made a number of other comedies, dramas, and musicals. Like Varda, he's been a major influence on younger filmmakers. For example, Damien Chazelle, director of the Oscar-nominated La La Land. For this course, I'm gonna strongly recommend that you view three or four feature films out of class using the free streaming service Canopy. The films are in French with English subtitles. Then in class, we'll have lecture, clips, contextual materials, and questions via the chat function of the software. I'd much rather see you in person, but we're all doing what we can to keep teaching and learning alive at OSHA. Hello, I'm Ellen O'Brien. And in this summer of endless hot days, it's hard to think that we'll soon be back at school. And school means fall. And fall means Halloween. And Halloween means witches. And witches mean evil. And evil means demons. And demons means devils. And the devils mean hell. So let's look at devils, demons, witches, and hell. We'll start in ancient Sumeria, the first civilization known to man. And they have some wonderful demons that will haunt your nights. And then we'll move south down into Egypt and they've got some really evil gods and goddesses, especially a lioness goddess who likes to drink the blood of humans and she brings death into the world. Then we'll move over to Greece and Greece has Prometheus and his dummy brother Epimetheus who goes ahead and marries Pandora and we know about her jar of troubles. And pretty soon we're in Christianity and it's got hell and demons. And we really want to look at Dante's nine layers of hell in the divine comedy and the supreme devil in Milton's paradise lost. So come join me this fall and we'll start with Halloween and witches. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ahmad Ashrati. Uh, I'd like to invite you to share in some thoughts about the Quran and modern society. Uh, the Quran, as you may know, is the scripture for more than a billion Muslims. All over the world, Muslims are faced with challenges coming from modern reality. In this course, we will discuss major understanding of the Quran as they relate to these modern challenges, namely the Quran and war and violence, the Quran and gender, the Quran and ethics, the Quran and art, the Quran and philosophy, the Quran and science, and the Quran and economy. The reading is light and the material will be provided. I hope to see you and uh, thank you. Hello, my OSHA friends. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ed Fotheringill, and I'll be teaching a course entitled Philosophical Issues, Nonviolence. When we look at the history of mankind on a micro or macro level, we clearly see that human beings have a propensity for violence. Richard Dawkins, the eminent evolutionary biologists strongly suggests that this propensity for violence or aggression is part of our genetic inheritance. 
we are what, as human beings, we are constituted to display violence. So the big question is this, how are we to live nonviolent lives? I think we can all agree that to live nonviolently would be the most virtuous form of being. So this course will examine the nature and dimensions of nonviolence. And we will focus specifically on five nonviolent activists. Uh, Mohandas Gandhi, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, Thomas Merton, and the Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. So if you're interested in a philosophical exploration of nonviolence, please consider taking my course. Thank you. Hi. I'm Jan Wilcox, and my eight-week course is Everyday Wonders, Novels of Charles Dickens, Bleak House and Great Expectations, and George Eliot, The Mill on the Floss, and especially Middlemarch. Two Victorian writers interested in the wonders in the everyday lives of children, women, men, and their communities. For example, People and communities become infected. How will they heal? They want peace, but have a crude system of criminal justice. Will politic, politicians, elections bring hope? Communities are structured and divided by a system of social class or caste. Sound intriguing? If maybe a little familiar, come join us. Thank you. Hello, my name is Makita Brotman, and this is my cat Bartleby. And I'm going to be teaching a course on the life and work of Edgar Allan Poe. Although this is my first time actually teaching at OSHA, I've been a literature professor for the last 20 years, mostly at MICA, and I'm also a psychoanalyst and the author of a number of works of true crime. Poe has always been one of my favorite writers, and as a psychoanalyst, I like to dig very deeply into the work. In this course, we'll be focusing mainly on what Poe described as his tales of the grotesque and arabesque, his gothic tales of doubling and haunting, his philosophical speculations, um, his tales of sensation, and some of his selected poems and, and criticism. We'll also um, take a look at the work of some of his most famous illustrators, and consider his complicated legacy in Baltimore, where he died in very mysterious circumstances in October 1849. So if you like to read, if you like to imagine, if you like to analyze and speculate, and if you don't mind entertaining some rather dark and disturbing ideas, I think you'll enjoy this course very much. Today in America, we are reflecting on the killing of George Floyd and on the legacy of John Lewis. And our reflection occurs on the 70th anniversary of the publishing of To Kill a Mockingbird, an American novel more meaningful and relevant today than it was stunning in 1960. As an invitation to sign up for my course, I pose this overarching question. To Kill a Mockingbird, whose story is it? I challenge us to explore beyond the iconic character of Atticus Finch to see through the lens of other characters, relationships, and conflicts in the novel, themes such as power, injustice, class, and love. We will complement our discussions with consideration of African-American poetry and art, documentary film footage, and Harper Lee's developing sensibility as an author. Discussing To Kill a Mockingbird in 2020, both daunting and invigorating. Join me in reading or rereading this American classic. I do ask that you digest part one of the novel by our first meeting, December 14th. Let's enjoy together how literature is both a window through which we see the world and a mirror in which we see ourselves. Hello. I'm Jackie Hedberg. Two years ago at lunch with a group of retired history teachers, my friend Kathy said to me, 
what you need to do next is teach a class about reconstruction. Nobody knows anything about reconstruction. During reconstruction, our country dealt with some of the biggest issues it has ever faced. Secession, emancipation, suffrage, and defining citizenship. So why don't we know about such an important period? I think part of the reason is that reconstruction is complicated and it wasn't the same nationwide. But beyond that, I now have another theory. Maybe another reason we don't study reconstruction is that we don't like to study America's failures. All the wars are exciting. They are filled with acts of heroism. Westward expansion and imperialism built an empire. Even the depression can be studied because we corrected weaknesses in our economic system as a result. But reconstruction, that was a failure. In the fall, I'm going to teach about reconstruction in the border state of Maryland. While my emphasis will be on Maryland, what happened in this state did not happen in isolation. I can't talk about what was happening in Annapolis without discussing events in Washington. And I can't talk about attitudes toward race in Maryland without talking about the South's philosophy of the lost cause. Had we succeeded in really reconstructing the slave states, there would have been no Jim Crow, no redlining, no Brown versus Topeka, Kansas, no March on Selma, and no George Floyd. Those things wouldn't have happened because long ago in this country, we would have guaranteed that black lives matter. I invite you to join me in studying this momentous period. Good morning. My name is Dr. Bob Baer, and the class I'm going to be teaching in the fall is called The Birth of Social Activism in America. And this uh, course is about the period prior to the American Civil War, when millions of Americans, primarily in the northern states, came together in associations and social grouping to really tackle many of the, what they saw as the social evils of the time, things like slavery and women's rights and uh, different uh, poverty and looking at education, providing education for all Americans and looking at uh, many of things, alcohol, all different kinds of, uh, and they would create social movement and social uh, engagement to really bring about social change in America. So this is a period prior to the Civil War in which really it was the creation of what we call American exceptionalism and really beginnings of American liberalism. And so this is a period you know, in which there's so much happened, but it's also a period in which there's really not a lot of discussion. It doesn't have to do with war or anything like that, but it has to do with really Americans coming together uh, in different groups in order to really try to help change America. Now, the class will end with, um, with a uh, course on, uh, the, um, on the equal rights movement in, in which when black Americans and women came together to really create the first organizations to look for voting rights, you know, to create voting equal rights voting rights for all Americans. So I hope you'll, you'll join me in this class and uh, hope to see you in the fall. My name is Bob Moore and I've prepared this course, The Causes of the Great War with Eric Stewart. The First World War or the Great War as it was called at the time was a catastrophe. More than 10 million combatants were killed. One in three French soldiers were either killed or wounded and even more Germans were casualties of the war. The Russians lost the most of all. Four empires collapsed. Most historians trace the Second World War to the Great War, which was also the direct cause of the communist revolution in Russia. Many historians stress impersonal forces such as nationalism and militarism for the advent of war in 1914. However, historian Margaret Macmillan blames the European leaders themselves. First, for a failure of imagination and not seeing how destructive such a conflict would be. And second, for their lack of courage to stand up to those who said there was no choice but to go to war. In this course, we will deal with the geopolitical situation in 1914 Europe, delve into the spirit of the times, explore international crises which preceded the July crisis of 1914, 
and introduce the decision makers who could have avoided the catastrophe. Eric and I hope you will join us on Zoom. Hello, my name is Rex Rayfeld, and of course it's a fantastic interim about the two decades between the two world wars, which were among the most important because of urbanization and the social changes, the development of the automobile, radio, and air travel, and in the way we accepted the role of the federal government. The course is divided into two parts, the first of which I gave in the fall of, 19, of 2019. In the spring, we were rudely interrupted by the virus, but I did give the first class of part two. But rather than repeat the first class, I've added a new subject, the racism of the 1920s and 1930s, including the tragic and outrageous incident of the 1920 Tulsa race massacre. Then we'll continue with the New Deal. And after that, this country's greatest ecological disaster, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. And we'll consider whether or not the League of Nations was in fact a failure. Then will come the refugee crisis, the voyage of the damned, and end with the beginning of World War II, September 3rd, 1939. I hope you'll join me. I think you'll find it very interesting. And it's not necessary to have been at the first class. After all, history knows no prerequisites. Thank you. I'm Michael Lamp. I'm a recovering journalist. Uh, many of you know me because I've taught at Osher several times. Uh, many of you have already hear, heard me propagandize about my propaganda past and present course, which we're presenting again. Rumor has it that I taught the first class in the spring this year. Um, I have a vague remember, remembrance of that. Uh, um, a lot has happened since then. Uh, we'll be trying it again this fall with courses at 11 a.m. on Thursday. Both sessions, eight courses starting on September 17th. I'll be running the first class from the beach, so have your daiquiris and sun umbrellas handy. And it will end on November 5th, all via Zoom classes, right? Same rules apply as last time. Most of you guys know me, know the drill. I'm big into politics and media. Propaganda has become a central force in American life, whether it's Russians manipulating Facebook, a national leader manipulating Facebook with disinformation, other politicians making up their own facts or public relations spin outfits, practicing large scale cover ups. Propaganda helps shape all that we do and think. In this course, we'll focus on the history of propaganda, what we can do to blunt its influence, and how to become aware of its presence in the news media that we consume every day. The writings of Jack L. Yu, George Orwell, Tim Wu, and a host of venerable historians and thinkers will lead us in an ongoing and detailed discussion of how propaganda aided by each succeeding wave of new technologies has grown to consume more and more of the media space. Hope to see you guys there this fall. I miss a lot of you very much, all of you very much, um, as I miss many things right now. Anyway, hope to see you in September, thanks. Hi, I'm Derek. I'm an advanced holistic nurse and clinical herbalist. Have you ever wondered how our ancestors knew which plants to use as medicine for specific human conditions? Through careful observation and experimentation, the forebears of modern medicine created the doctrine of signatures. This is a system that identifies plant habitats and morphology and correlates them with shocking accuracy to human conditions and body systems. In my four part class, we will deep dive into the patterns that make up this system, as well as any surviving plant based medical systems such as traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda. We'll explore how modern pharmacology relied heavily on plant chemistry in its beginnings, and we'll look into the future to imagine how herbal remedies can be integrated into our modern medicine. I hope you'll join me. Hi all, I'm Dr. Jody Johnson, and I am going to be teaching an eight week class called Toward Sustainability. In the first week, we will talk about food and how we manage GMOs and agriculture and our meat industry and how the effects of that. The second, is, the second week is on energy, on light, on heat, on how we travel. The third is on native and non-native species and how when we move species in or out of a biome, how it affects the biome. The fourth is on pollination and how pollination is accomplished and how diverse it can be and how it can change a biome. The fifth is on pesticides 
and uh, how we can arrest evolution sometimes or cause species decline based on that. The sixth is on invasive species and how we inadvertently introduce species onto continents, species that we may not want. The seventh is on voting with your money and the decision making that we go through every day. And the last class is a sharing of ideas of all people who care about sustainability and how they think that they've got a good idea toward it and what the effects of that would be. So please join me. I'd love to meet you. Take care. Bye. Hello. Really appreciate you looking at the screen and not at Comet Neo Wise. Up there in the Northwest, just below the Big Dipper. Hope you can join us in our exploration of the strangest things up there colliding massive objects, blinding candles, pulsating blobs, matter we can only feel, and along the way, hazardous nebulae, burning hot gases, and many, many things that go bump in the night. Is this a course about astronomy? Well, yes, but really we're talking about ourselves. We are made of stardust, stuff created in these objects. Thanks again, and we're done learning about all these great courses. Remember to keep looking up. See you in October.